That was awesome. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, two parts to our message today. One is a little work on your part, okay? So I want to get, get it in your help you and, and uh, ask the Holy Spirit to really uh, speak to us this morning. And uh, I think this would be helpful if uh, you do a little bit of a thought on it from Song of Solomon. Uh, so I'll teach you something for a few minutes and then I'll have you be talking for a minute uh, about it. okay so about it all right the uh, we want to remember the story on the 7-eleven plastic spoon donation why the man was so angry about it I don't know maybe he had gotten his bill for plastic spoons and didn't want to give one away, or he had a problem at home, or he just heard bad news, or uh, he just took a look at Mark, Pastor Mark, and he looked like his arch enemy, and he just didn't want anything to do with him. We don't know why. <laughs> he was angry, though. Threw the spoon at him. All right. What I'd like you to uh, think about this morning is love, nature of God, and love. This is Song of Solomon, and this is a, a short diagram that I think is useful for us. Um, and it has to do with the Jewish temple, tabernacle rather, tabernacle. This was the one in the desert, and there's the outer court, and then the tent for the worship, divided in two parts equally divided and uh, this is a picture of a human being this is bird's eye view we have the outer court we have outside the tabernacle and then we have the um, going in is our first entry the first entry into worship is through the outer court that's this part without a lot of detail, but just to say, when we read our Bible, we read outer court history. When we read our Bible, we read uh, stories about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the kings of Israel, uh, the movings of the nation of Israel, the history of the nation of Israel, and we see in the outer court how people lived, how they fought, how they died, what they did, and so on. The outer court of life, and we see it as we live in this life. You can read, the, see the news, uh, follow events. You can see the stores and the highway and your home and, and so on. So this is part of your life. Then you come into this place, which was the holy place. And this is where in our comparison here we have the gospels and we see the light of christ we see the epistles and the teaching uh, of the apostles uh, we also see love god loves me i see that in the epistles and the teaching i i see it and it comes personally to me there was a lame man Christ met him, and Christ healed him and changed his life. That brings me close to God and his love. And I want to believe that God is love because the Bible says so. And this brings us here into the inner, the holy of holies, it's called. And this is the outline of the tabernacle. And in the Holy of Holies, we have the very person of God, the presence of God here, Holy of Holies. And this is in the Word, in our Bible. When the Spirit brings the Word uh, right into my spirit, by using a piece of the history as a teaching of the epistles, the Gospels, and I like to put here Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, because it is the song of all the songs, and we will look at that in a minute here. 
This is where God is saying, you and I are connected. You and I, you are in my family. You are my child. Do you know it? Do you know me? <clears throat> I know you. I love you. I save you. I called you. When Christ said to the disciples, he said, you have not chosen me. But in their history, you could say, you know, yes, Lord, we chose you. Remember, we were in the Sea of Galilee, and you said, follow me. And we looked at our nets and our boat, and we looked at the Sea of Galilee and our fish, and we made a decision. And Christ would say, yeah, I know you did, but you've got to listen to me now. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. This is a mystery, but in worship, the believer must go past the histories and just merely the doctrines, and he must go into the very presence where Christ communicates to you deeply, deeply, personally, beyond your failure and your success, beyond your personality and your temperament, beyond ourselves, where the Holy Spirit ministers to our spirit. And in our, in our ministry, we realize that in the ministry of greater grace, we have this part, uh, we have the outer court, we have also the messages and the truths, but more, and this is where our desire is for all of us, and we're all learning it, and we're going to speak about it today. More, I want the personal communion with the living God that gives to us our freedom, our joy, and our peace that passes understanding. And Pastor Shabelli is going to speak about that tonight. The peace that goes beyond, beyond. I mean, I say it because he shared yesterday, and I think you're going to do that tonight, right, Pastor? Okay, he is. So, peace beyond understanding. I have my history, but I, I want to walk beyond. I want to go into the Holy of Holies. And by the way, in this part of the, now we move to Solomon's temple, and this is the template for the temple. This is a tabernacle. Tabernacle was a, a movable tent, but Solomon's temple was a building. And in this particular room here, there was no natural light, no window. There was no candle, no oil. It was a dark room, and why? God said, I dwell in darkness. I am the light. This is a, sounds a little contradictory, but follow it with me. I am your light. Not a moral light. I am more than a moral light. I am light. I am the light of lights. I am God, and in me is no darkness at all, no sin. We read this psalm, well, I hardly hear it quoted, though Dr. Stevens quoted it, and it's this one. God said, I am angry with the wicked every day. In meditating on that, I am angry with the wicked every day. I was thinking, why is that? because it contradicts his nature, because wickedness is contrary to him. He has no choice, but we'll see his mercy in a few minutes and his love for the unsaved. He has an amazing ministry to unsaved people, uh, but I would never want to mislead an unsaved person into thinking that God is loving them as they live in their wickedness. I am angry with the wicked every day. 
please try to absorb it, understand it, and the Holy Spirit can show you and I things right there in the Holy of Holies. That means in our, our spirit, we understand deep things and amazing things that feed us from the Bible. And this is our joy. Okay, so now read Song of Solomon, please, in verses 5 and 6 and 7. Who is this that comes up from the wilderness? Would you read it out loud with me? I think it would be good for you to read it out loud. Who is this that comes up from the wilderness? Let's try it again. Are you there? Song of Solomon. I'm sorry, what? Chapter 8. Thanks. I think you're going to have to get used to that because part of my brain is gone. It's gone. It is gone. And it does, it's not there anymore. So Song of Solomon chapter. Read it anyway. I told you to read out of Song of Solomon chapter, okay, chapter 8. Okay. Verse 5. Don't give me those excuses. Read it. Okay. Chapter 8, verse 5. Who is this that comes up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? That right there, wow, beautiful, isn't it? Who is this that comes up from the wilderness? From where? The wilderness of life. From Hopkins, the hallways of Hopkins, hallways of Towson University, hallways of the Black and Decker factory, the hallways of the used car lot, where you come up out of the wilderness, what are you doing? Leaning on your beloved. I raise you up under the apple tree. There your mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bear thee. Your mother. And of course, we think of these relationships as romance. There is the love. Uh, and then we have here uh, the apple tree, where, where the, the woman is growing and understanding under the apple tree. Set me as a seal, verse 6, upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Set me as a seal upon your heart, on your arm, like you think of a tattoo. Now, I know after I can, I'm done preaching, everybody's going to run out and get a tattoo. As Pastor said, get tattoos. No, I didn't. Set me as a seal. Maybe it is a mark, a, a seal. Maybe it's a a necklace or a brooch or a ring or uh, some mark. But it's got to be more than on the body. It has to be in the heart. I tell you a story. When I was living in Hungary, my wife was living here in America, and we would uh, contact each other by phone. Uh, this was before, you know, Skyping and the Internet and all. And... Uh, uh, I love my wife because she let me go as a missionary. She encouraged me to go as a missionary. She wanted me to serve God. She believed I should be in Hungary, but she also had, uh, we, we had three children, and she had a big responsibility to raise them without me, but I was coming and going. So I lived over for some months and came back and so on. They, the details of that I could talk about, but it, it's not. The point is that I saw my wife's character. I already knew it, but I saw it even more. I saw her willingness to sacrifice me in our relationship that we both enjoyed so much for something higher and more, more important or for a period of time we believe, just for a period of time. And when we first went to Hungary, I said to Lisa, I said, let just go for one year, I promise, one year. One year, promise, you can trust me. 
one year, and so we did. But it didn't stop there. Like she fulfilled her part joyfully, but then also felt it was so 13 years later. <laughs> 13 years later. <laughs> okay, this is what I want to say. I loved her more and more and more as I saw her and I knew her and I believed in her. I read the story from Spurgeon. He said that, um, that um, uh, a man was sick. How did it go? A man was sick and he had the medicine next to him and he received a letter and the letter said, your doctor actually is planning to kill you by poisoning you. And his doctor was also his friend. But he received this letter saying, your doctor is planning to poison you. So he had the medicine. He had his relationship with his doctor. And then he had to make a decision. But it wasn't a, really a big one. He took the medicine. He ate it. And then he showed the letter to his friend, his doctor. And basically saying, I don't believe this letter. I trust you. I know you. That's a great story. I think somebody could tell a lie about my wife, but I would not believe. I mean, anything other than what I know about her. I know her character. I know her nature. And this is important with God because, to be honest, when it comes to God, there's a lot of reason not to trust him. There's a lot of pain. And sometimes we say, why did he do this to me, if not many times? But do we love? This is what my wife and I enjoyed so much and enjoy today. And it is love. Love is as strong as death. Even if there is the death, love is stronger. When Christ died and he was buried, it didn't stop Mary from going to the tomb to give him proper burial. As though he is dead and maybe she would never see him again and maybe... Yeah, you know, she knew it was over. It didn't stop her service, her love. Because life is about love. God is love. God loves you. You are a seal, you are a seal on his hand, on his heart. We read it in Isaiah. He, we are engraved in his hands. And we read here that the love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals are of our coals of fire, which hath the most vehement flame. Verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the fl floods drown it. I will believe you again. I will trust you again. I love you. I will believe in you again. I will trust you again because I love you. I believe in you, God. I believe in you. I know you love me, though many things I do not understand. Why don't you make yourself more clearly known to me? Why don't I see it? Look at back at our first little diagram here. Why don't I see it here in the history? And sometimes we do. But sometimes we don't. Ask Job. Job, in your history, how many children have died? Ten. Ten, not one or two. Ten. Does God love you? Good question. Very good question. I may not see it in the history, but do I know his nature? 
just like with the, the doctor and the poisoned, uh, the medicine there that wasn't poison, but he said it was. The letter said it, he's trying to poison you. So similarly, there are tests in our relationships. And I want you to see something in Genesis 42, and this is the heart of the message today. Genesis 42. And I've never really saw this until now, and I think it's amazing. And here's a little diagram on it. I said, I, I said I'd have you be talking to each other, but forget it. <laughs> That'd be a disaster anyway. I'm joking. Here's Joseph, and who is around him in our diagram? Rocks. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many I drew. I don't care to count them. How many are there? Eleven brothers, right? Joseph had how many brothers? Eleven, okay. They're around him. If you know the story, they sold, put him in a pit. They sold him to a caravan passing through the Megiddo Valley area. You can see it there when you're in Israel, if you ever go on a trip, and I highly recommend a trip to Israel. Those are amazing trips, and we go every couple of years, uh, and some go more often, but Israel is an amazing experience. I love it. Every time I go, if I can go, I would go all the time. I think it's amazing, so just throw that out there for you. Caravan came to the Megiddo Valley. Joseph is in a pit. They sold him to the caravan guys. He went down into Egypt, sold Joseph as a slave. And the story goes on. Joseph goes to prison. Eventually he's promoted. Now he is out and he's in charge. It's an amazing story. His brothers are starving in Israel. And I like this part when Jacob, their father, said, why are you guys hanging around? Just hanging around. Why don't you go f find some food? Go do something. Make yourself useful. <laughs> yeah, it's in the same chapter, 42.1. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? <laughs> Goofballs? <laughs> what, are we going to hang around, just look at each other and starve to death? Get moving. Get moving. So where did they go? Down into Egypt, they heard there was corn there. Now they are standing around Joseph. This is amazing. They are all there, but they don't know it's Joseph. Years have passed. And they don't know it's Joseph. This is like God and us. This is like us and God. God is here, but we don't know who he is. We don't really know, does he love me? I think he doesn't. Where is he? I haven't seen God anywhere. I have not heard him. He is not behind me, not in front of me, not on my sides. Where is God? The world is saying this. And so the believer also sometimes. We read it in the Psalms. But here's the verse, 8. Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. They, he knew them, but they did not know him. So what would you do if you were in that situation? What do you think? Go ahead, you can tell me. Huh? What would you do? Talk to your neighbor, ask him. Go ahead. What? <laughs> revenge, okay. What is that? What's behind the revenge? I don't know. What, what would you do? These are my brothers. I, and I know them, and they don't know me, so what am I going to do? Uh, 
See, I've got to, I'm happy to do this to you because I could give you the answer, but you've got to be thinking with me, right? Come on. What are you going to do? Come on, you know that. You know what you're going to do. What? Go back to your neighbor again. Go talk to your neighbor. <laughs> what? Forgive him. Okay. Come on, it's so simple. What are you going to do? You're going to say, I am Joseph. Right? These are my brothers. I haven't seen them for years. I'm going to say, whoa, hey, guys, I got a huge secret. I cannot even help but tell you right away. I am Joseph. But what did Joseph do? He didn't tell them. Look at our picture here. How much time passes. And he does not tell them who he is. You know, why? Why, why is Joseph saying, you guys pulled a fast one on me, so I'm going to pull a fast one on you, and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. Or, or why doesn't he say, I am Joseph? Start speaking in Hebrew right away. His mother tongue. Start talking about Jacob. Dad, is he alive? How about, do you have any other brothers? I'm sorry. We had at the first meeting, there were 10 brothers because Benjamin didn't come, the youngest one. But what, what, what does this story say to me or to you? It says to me, God does not always show us that he is here. In the same way that Joseph did not show his brothers, I am Joseph, because there is a process here, and this is very important. There is a, a working in love. This was love that said, love controlled him. He was controlled by love, and he didn't say anything because he loved them. He loved them. He didn't say anything. Why? Because he's going to teach them. He's going to get their attention. He's going to train them. He's going to build character in them. He's going to do, remember they bought the corn and they had these uh, sacks. And we could draw one like this here, okay? These were the sacks of food that they brought back home. And they paid for the f food, but he put the money back in the sacks, in the mouth of the sack. He put the money back in there. Why? He didn't need the money. That's one reason. I don't care about your money. I care about you. I care about you. You are my brothers. You don't know this. But I am, I am here, and I'm going to work with you because I'm interested in your nature, in your character. And this is something that people don't understand about love. They think love is just so sweet and so, you know, it is so... Um, making me comfortable and making everything nice and convenient. And they say, that is love. But God is saying, no, I have a love that you do not know about. I have a nature that I need to teach you my nature. And this happened twice. They came on their way back. They realized they had the money. How did this happen? They go back. And Joseph says something very, very profound. He said, if you are telling me the truth, then you go back home and you bring your brother. So there'll be 11 now that'll come back. 
and bring, I'm sorry, that's another error to Simeon, leave Simeon here as a, as a um, guarantee, yeah. But bring Benjamin if there is another brother. And Joseph is thinking this will be the brother of my mother, because Jacob had four wives. So some of these men, they are his half-brothers. He brings, they, they go back home and they tell Jacob this, and Jacob is totally upset. Why did you tell him you had another brother? Why is this going on? Why is there money in your sacks? And remember, when, when uh, Benjamin came, he, took, he gave Benjamin five times what everybody else had, but he did something else. He put a, a chalice, a gold chalice in the mouth of Benjamin's sack. And he goes, ah, they find that out. Now they're in a lot of trouble. There is a lot of trouble in this story before he reveals himself to them as his brother. This is a great thing to think about and to contemplate because I believe that God says to us when he says, I love you, I believe that this love is a love that is, that is so, somehow a, a, such a deep love, and he wants us to catch it. I was thinking how easy it would be to get saved, and immediately you are glorified. Immediately. No sin nature, glorified body. Immediately. Lord, why didn't you do that? And Lord will say, the sacks. The sacks. I'm going to teach you something. Before I show you, here's a believer, before I show you this amazing glory and victory, I'm going to, I will hide from you. You will not know me. But if you go into the, you go back in, you know, this uh, part, you, oh, you, you are in this, uh, here, you know me. I, I will, you can know me as much as you want. You can know me in the spirit. You can know me in your faith, in your obedience to me. I delight in revealing myself to you. But if you play games with me, I will play games with you. If you are not really interested in who I am, then I will show you. I will lead you in trouble. And this is another meditation that I had last night. And I was thinking of all the little things that cause us trouble. And I was thinking lice. They're very small. Frogs, right? Flies. It's like humiliating to Pharaoh in Egypt. Pharaoh could say, hey, I am huge and big and strong. My army is incredible. My chariots are mighty. And the Lord goes, uh huh. Mm -hmm -hmm. Lice. Rain, hail, frogs. Sarah, how do you like your frogs? Everywhere, frogs everywhere. Listen to me. I believe there's an arrogance that happens in our heart and in our culture. There's an arrogance that we have regarding life and about God. And we feel we can order God around and make our demands. And the Lord said, I'll talk to you in a couple of years. Here's some lice. I bet this one. And a woman, a woman is, and with all great respect and honor to the godly woman here, but a woman can be a narrow pit, the proverb says. Ungodly woman, virtuous woman of Proverbs 31, <laughs> who could ever find a greater gift that a woman that is godly, how awesome. But I think of men that fall into a pit. I think of people that have, a fl have flies and frogs and lice and little things. How about this one? Stolen identity. That's a modern day type of uh, plague of some kind. 
stolen identity. I got everything going for me and somebody steals my identity. I lose my, all of my benefits. What? Do you not fear God? Do you, know that not, do you not know that God can deliver you from such a plague as that, or this one, or this one, or this one, or this one? And even maybe contrarily, do you believe that God could use these little plagues, like Joseph put the money in the sack, sent them off, and then they're looking at each other and saying, what is going on? Now we're in trouble. Now we got to go back there to Egypt. And then it happens again. And then Benjamin is involved. And it's an amazing story of love. You say, Pastor, where is the love in the lice and the frogs and the flies? Are you kidding? That is love. Are you kidding? Why would it profit a man if he saves it? he... He gains the whole world and loses his soul. Are you kidding? Don't you realize that all of the trouble that is out there is ordained and sent of God to get our attention? Because he knows the believer, but it is also the believer that does not know him. But they know to draw the tabernacle. They know the outer court. They may know the Bible. They may know the doctrines. But come on. Do they have a knowledge that is overwhelmingly touching to us? Christ. Christ lives. Christ, the answer. Christ, the way, the truth. Christ, my peace, my freedom, my joy. Christ, the one that loves me. I'm leaning on my beloved coming up out of the wilderness because in him is this amazing comfort and high thinking. Because when Joseph finally said, he broke, he started to weep when he saw Benjamin and his brothers there. He started to weep. And you know what they were thinking? They were thinking like this in the process. They were thinking the, the bags and... They were thinking the money and the cup and everything. And God is saying, I don't care about your works, your money, your, those details. I need to get your attention. I don't care about the frogs and the lice and the difficult woman that you live with. That may be the case, but do you realize that I am getting your attention and that I am actually the God that loves. And I agree with everybody in this room that this is a challenging, a challenging principle for us. We could ask Job. We could ask Christ. When you're hanging on the cross, do you trust your Father? Yes, I do. I trust Him and I know Him. This is love. Christ, this is love. This is love. This is God. This is God's plan. This is God's way. Yeah, but it, it, I'm looking for comfort and healing. That's another question that I could bring up to us today, and it is sickness. There's a terrible teaching uh, that is taken from Isaiah 53 about the teach healing and the atonement. If you are saved, you are healed always. Sickness is not God's plan for you. Sickness cannot be his will because Christ died and by his stripes we are healed. But this is, cannot be the case because the Apostle Paul spoke, never taught that in his epistles. Contrarily, he said, Trophimus have I left at Miletus sick. Paul had many afflictions, many sicknesses, but he never said, that this is not God's will. But he said, he, instead he said that I have a thorn in my, in my body, a thorn in my flesh, but God has given me greater grace. Sickness is his plan. You might say, no, it cannot be. Yes, it is. 
It's part of his plan to show us something deeper working in us. Our light affliction is only for a moment, but it works for us a far to greater degree of glory. When Joseph appeared and he said, I am your brother Joseph, finally, and his brothers all around him, it says they were confused. They couldn't get it. They were confused. And I think that happens to us too. I am Christ. Do you realize that? And we say, really? Have you been with us through this whole process? Yes, I am the author of it. You say, really, Jesus, even when I was sick? Yes, I was by your bedside every day, all the time. I am love. You do not understand my love, but I'm going to teach it to you and lead you in love. I want you to learn love, agape love. 1 Corinthians 13. And then what did Joseph say? And we can end with this. Joseph said, did he talk about the money, the cup, the chalice, and the sack? Did he talk about any of those things? Did he accuse them? Did he say, you guys are just, just thieving, lying, cheating guys, brothers that have caused a lot of trouble to me? No, he didn't. He talked only about God. Don't let this bother you. God has preserved me and you. God is with us. Don't let this trouble you. God is here. God has saved me. God has answered prayer. God has delivered. God is with us, our nation, our little group of people. God is faithful in his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And now I am Joseph, and you are the brothers and the heads of the tribes that we will become in time. God is in this whole picture. We say when we're in the death, we're on our deathbed, no, love is not here. But then God says, love is as strong as death. And we say, how could this happen to me? I thought you loved me. And God will say, I need you to know me more deeply. I need you to know me in here. I need you to go beyond just the history and the doctrines. The doctrines reveal who I am, but I need more. I need the Holy Spirit to put it in your spirit, to give you peace that passes understanding and love that goes beyond knowledge. I need you to love me the way, the way you loved your wife when you were f far away from her and you just reflected on her, her nature and her character. I want you to trust in your friend. Your friend, you trust him even if you get a letter that says he's going to poison you. It doesn't move you because you know your friend. You know who he is. That kind of knowledge, this is what you and I love in the body of Christ. It is a knowledge that is given and imparted to us. It is that when we know him, that I may know him, Paul said, and the power of his resurrection, then many waters cannot quench it. Many waters cannot drown it. Many afflictions cannot change it. Many diseases cannot pollute that love, that cannot be overcome by many lice and frogs and uh, all of those plagues. No plague can overcome this love. Ask Jesus Christ. And he would say, human beings need to learn this love. Suffer well. Trust me. Lean upon your beloved. Trust in me with all your heart. And let, let me say this. The heart pants after the water brooks, it says, as the heart in, in Psalm, it was a 42, verse 1. Heart pants after the water brooks. And I was thinking, it's like a little deer in the running for water, looking for water. And I was thinking, it doesn't say a camel pants after the water brooks. Why? Because a camel absorbs an enormous amount of water in its body and it has it as a reserve but a heart a little deer doesn't have a reserve 
It doesn't have a reserve. And it's the same with me. I don't have a reserve. I need it now. And then I need it now. And I need it now. I don't have a reserve. I cannot lean on my histories. I cannot just lean on the doctrines alone. I must lean upon him and his love. And then he will refresh in me and fill us and anoint us with the Spirit and we will have what we need. But I am sorry to say, and I'm sure it happens to all of us at different times, People lean on their histories, and they lean only on their doctrines. And I love the doctrine, but it's still not enough. I need his person. I need him to come in to the picture. I need him to say, I am here. And when he's like playing a game with me, and I am not seeing it, i got to believe that that game is for my benefit. It's not a capricious game, a game of trickery or foxiness, no. It's a game of development, of courage, of love, of understanding. It is a game for our enrichment, our encouragement, our education. It is a way that he deals with us in our lives. It's his plan. And I would be the first one to say, if my brothers are there, go, I'm, I'm just, let me tell you the story. i got to tell you what happened. And go through the whole thing, but he didn't. Because there's something deeper there. And I think God is very excited to talk to us and tell us amazing things. I think God wants to show us his power and his ways and his comfort. I think he's very eager to do it. But he also cares very much about us. And he cares very much that we would really know him. Not in our flesh, but really know him. And there is a kind of brokenness and humility required because we cannot know him without it. There has to be an amazing kind of attitude of, I need you. I want you. Please satisfy me. Fill me. I am so hungry for you. Whatever you do, I will trust you. Whatever comes my way, I will believe. I will trust. I will bow my knees before you and in my heart. I will put all my trust in you. And you will fill me and show me. You will be very rich toward me. For Christ made this possible for every one of us. As we, as we sang in the beginning, if God is for us, if God is loving me, then please do not misunderstand and believe a lie about him. Do not read that letter and say, my friend is my enemy. Do not, do not interpret the lice and the frogs and everything as something that is outside of God's deepest interest and care and concern for Pharaoh and the Egyptians. But Pharaoh hardened his heart, never knew God, and perished and went to hell. Hell is a place where God is not. He is everywhere but not there. Hell is a place where there is no comfort but yourself, and it's never enough. And this is, this is, in this world, the primary issue here is that God would show, would reveal, that we would know him and walk with him. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we are just hungry to speak and speak and speak. We have an amazing congregation of listening ears. We are so hungry for more and more. This summer is a deep a place where deep things are understood, spoken about, reflected on. Uh, you've given us this time. For some of us, it might be our last summer. 
It could be our last months on earth. We don't know. But we are not afraid because love is strong as death and many waters cannot quench it. We're not afraid to die. We're afraid to live without you. We're afraid to live without purpose. We're afraid to live without knowing you. But if we know you, no matter how long or short our lives are, our lives are precious and valuable because we know you. Thank you for that knowledge. We pray we would understand this. Jesus. And all the congregation just praying right now for unsaved people in Baltimore City and for people to come to this church and sit and listen to the gospel for people to hear it on the street corners, to hand, out, to hand out material and people to hear it, for people to hear it on the internet, for people to come to Christ. Jesus, please bring people to you, Lord. Bring people at work. They're the stronger message this morning is the message that comes out of your mouths this week as you speak to people at work and love them and encourage them and teach them that this message goes into your spirit and then you take it and it cooks in there or just kind of ferments and revolves rotates round around about in the heart then i have a word in season to him that is weary Please do that in Baltimore City, in the area, the county, wherever we go. Lord, please, Jesus. And then if you're listening and you're not a believer, please say to Jesus, I trust you. Christ, the one on the cross, God, not far from any one of us. Put all your trust in him. If you're doing that for the first time in your life, please raise your hand this morning. Anyone, please raise your hand. Just put it up. Yes, Lord, we pray. God, we pray, we pray we will not stop. We pray that new people will come in. We pray that people will come to Christ every Sunday. We want scores of people to come to Christ. We want people to come to Christ so much, so much in our hearts. A new life. There are people with amazing problems, and they, they must come to you and repent of their own way and turn from their own life and trust you with all their hearts. And please do this in Jesus' name, we pray. In Christ's name, we ask it. Amen. One uh, request, um, I fly to Finland today, tonight, or the afternoon. So uh, I'll be there this week in Finland where I used to live earlier years ago as a missionary we have a conference there thank you for your prayers for the conference there and uh then the that sunday morning week from today i fly to hungary and i'll be there for some days and um again uh we were missionaries there and and uh, god blessed it and we're going to meet with the churches there in hungary so I mean this when I say uh, it's not by men, it's not the, my, by might or power, it's by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit doing this. Thank you for your prayers uh, for me and my family. Uh, I go with a couple, a couple brothers I'll meet over there, Tommy Colban and uh, Ben Munson, and uh, my family's here, but um, thanks for your prayers. Amen.